My parents immigrated from India 40 years ago to Southwest Ohio, where I was born. They weren't rich. I asked my dad why he chose to come to Ohio, and he said it's because his older sister, who also came from India, lived in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Now, that, of course, begged the question of why my aunt had left India all the way to come to Fort Wayne. And we joke around that because it's the only state where the word India is actually contained in the name of the state, Indiana. So that's the story we tell anyway. My dad was a company man himself. He was in at GE's Evendale, Ohio plant. He worked there loyally for over 40 years. And my mom was a geriatric psychiatrist who spent most of her career treating patients with Alzheimer's disease in nursing homes in the Ohio area. If I learned one thing during my own upbringing, it was that being the odd man out in a crowd isn't always a bad thing. I went to a pretty rough public school through eighth grade where it wasn't particularly abnormal for a kid to show up to school with a knife. My parents then switched me to a private Jesuit high school, something that actually shaped my own views, even though I'm a Hindu. And when I went on to college and I graduated from Harvard in 2007 in biology, I ended up becoming a biotech investor rather than an academic scientist. I went to law school along the way. I went to Yale. I had an itch to study law and political philosophy, but I decided to keep my job at the fund where I worked. And after I finished law school in 2013, I had a new itch. I had an itch to build something rather than just be a passive investor in biotech. So I left my job to start a biotech company. I started by developing a drug for Alzheimer's disease, a passion that I'd actually picked up from my mother. But ultimately that drug failed. It was the first drug we developed. That failure hurt and it chastened me. But it also taught me that hardship isn't the same thing as victimhood. And eventually the company thankfully went on to develop important medicines for other diseases that helped a lot of patients in the end one of which was a drug for prostate cancer. I led the company for seven years until I stepped down as CEO this January because I felt even more compelled to help treat a different kind of cancer. It's one that affects the heart of our country. It's not a biological cancer. It's a cultural one. And given the reality of the world that we live in, I wasn't really free to speak about it as the CEO of a high profile company. So I had to step down so that I could talk about it, not as a CEO, but as a citizen. That new disease, that new infection is spreading across our country like wildfire. It is one that even the best of science is not going to cure. And that new disease is called woke culture. It's the new secular religion in America. And its belief system centers on the idea that your identity is based on your race, your gender, and your sexual orientation, full stop. It posits that America is a systemically racist country and that if you're black, you're inherently disadvantaged, and that if you're white, you're inherently privileged, no matter how much money you have, no matter what your upbringing was. Your race and gender govern who you are and what thoughts you're allowed to have. That's it. Congresswoman Ayanna Presley summed it up pretty neatly last year, actually, when she unapologetically declared, we don't need any more black faces that don't want to be a black voice. We don't need any more brown faces that don't want to be a brown voice, end quote. I'm going to guess that I don't fit her description of what counts as a brown voice. Here's the clever part about how this particular virus spreads. If you disagree with any of those claims, then that actually means you're just racist and you don't know it. And the more you resist a woke claim, the more that's seen to validate it. If you say, I'm not racist, that means you are racist. If you say all lives matter, that somehow means that you believe that black lives don't matter. If you capitalize the W in white or fail to capitalize the B in black, you're racist. And there is no greater damnation in modern America than to be labeled a racist. So between pledging fealty to this new religion and being tarred with the scarlet R, everyday Americans are choosing to bend the knee. The consequences may be existential for America. This has created a new culture of fear in our country, fear of losing your job, fear of failing a class at school, fear of becoming a pariah in your own community. And almost every day, somebody new is sacrificed at the altar and excommunicated from civil society for saying the wrong thing. This new culture of fear has completely eroded our culture of free speech in America. A good measure of the health of any democracy, especially American democracy, is the percentage of people who actually feel free to say what they actually think in public. And right now, I am sorry to say that we are doing abysmally on that metric. According to a recent survey conducted by the Cato Institute, over 60% of Americans, an overwhelming majority of this country, says they are afraid of saying what they believe because of the current political climate. That is not America. 
It is not the country that my, my parents came halfway across the world to join. It is not the country I learned to pledge allegiance to as a kid. We have a new red guard in our country that's reminiscent of the Chinese Cultural Revolution, except instead of adhering to Marxism, the new guiding principle for today's red guard is this new form of wokeism. So that's where we are today. In the name of diversity, we've sacrificed true diversity of thought. In the name of democracy, we've sacrificed our most important democratic norms of free speech and open debate. In the name of inclusion, we've created an exclusionary culture where certain views are just not welcome. So how did we get here? How did this new wokeism become so dominant in our country? The story goes back to the 1990s. A new discipline emerged in American academia. It was called critical race theory. It posited that race and other inherited characteristics created these invisible power structures that actually govern our real social relationships. In the 1890s, Karl Marx had posited that the invisible power relationships were based on economic disempowerment. But critical race theory changed that narrative. By the 1990s, critical race theory posited that the real culprit was invisible racial disempowerment. That's when wokeism was born. Now, to be clear, in the 90s, wokeism used to be about challenging the system. And there's something about that which I respect, even if I disagree with it. But today, wokeism is not about challenging the system. Wokeism is the system. So how did this fringe intellectual theory from unknown academics in the 1990s manage to infect our most important social institutions today? That is the question. And in my opinion, the answer actually begins with the 2008 financial crisis. Immediately after the 08 crisis, you'll remember, corporations were the bad guys. The old left used to say that corporate power was bad, and the thing we needed to do was redistribute money from rich people to poor people to help poor people. Agree or not, that was their theory. But the new modern woke left in the post-2008 world had a different theory. They said that the real problem wasn't poverty. It wasn't economic injustice. Rather, it was racial injustice and misogyny and bigotry. And guess what? That presented a once-in-a-generation opportunity for Wall Street. They could no longer be the bad guys, but instead could actually become the good guys just by adopting these woke values. Now, remember Occupy Wall Street. That was after 2008. That was a tough pill for Wall Street to swallow. But this wokeism stuff, that was easy. Applaud diversity and inclusion, put some women on boards, create an affinity group for analysts of color, you're good to go. Just look at what Goldman Sachs did last year when its CEO declared from, of course, the mountaintops of Davos that Goldman would not take a company public in the United States unless it met Goldman Sachs' standards for board diversity, where, of course, Goldman's the sole arbiter of who counts as diverse. The banks were thrilled to dance to this new woke tune. They were happy to lend both their money and their legitimacy and their credibility to this new woke movement. But they only need one thing in return, just one ask in return. Woke left, get the new left to leave Wall Street alone. And it worked. Each side won from the trade. Big banks got to use their market power to force these woke values down our throats. And in return, the new left agrees to look the other way when it comes to leaving their market power intact. So in a nutshell, here's how it worked. Wall Street got in bed with a bunch of woke millennials. Together, they birthed woke capitalism. And of course, they put Occupy Wall Street up for adoption. You don't even know what that is anymore. That's the Wall Street edition. As it turns out, there's a really similar backroom deal playing out in the other coast, in Silicon Valley as well. And here's the way it works over there. Woke activists demand that big tech censors political views that they don't like. And in return, the left agrees to leave big tech's monopoly power intact. And again, it is working masterfully for both sides. That is how this new arranged marriage works. This is not a marriage of love. This is more like mutual prostitution, and it is working. And the net result is the rise of America's newest leviathan, the woke industrial complex. It is no longer just Wall Street. It is no longer just Silicon Valley. It is the entirety of corporate America as we know it. It's Coca-Cola training its employees on, quote unquote, how to be less white. And issuing public statements about voting laws that make it sound more like a super PAC than a soft drink manufacturer. It's United Airlines saying that it's going to apply a quota system based on race and gender to the pilots who are in the cockpit, even if that means throwing out pilot tests as a part of the process. It's Major League Baseball deciding to move this year's All-Star game out of Atlanta. It is Nike donating tens of millions of dollars to Black Lives Matter, a Marxist movement that professes to care about black lives while it also calls for the decimation of the nuclear family structure. While, by the way, Nike, of course, continues to market $200 sneakers to black kids in the inner city who can't afford to buy books for school. Go figure. 
Liberals accept it because they love woke causes. Old school Republicans look the other way because their inner conscience tells them that the free market can do no wrong without realizing that the so-called free market that they idealized doesn't actually exist today. So both sides are ultimately blinded to the rise of this new 21st century monster that is far more insidious and far more powerful than anything we have seen in the history of our country. Now, I would love to tell you that it doesn't get any worse than that, but it does. It does get worse. There's a new guest who's shown up on the scene and turned this unholy alliance into a threesome. That's the Communist Party of China. They understand this game more deeply than any of us. There is even a Chinese word for wokeness. Baitsuo is the word. It literally refers to woke white people in the United States, and they use it to laugh at us. And even worse, they're using wokeism as a geopolitical tool to erode our standing on the global stage. And if you have any doubt about that, just look at what they're saying. Last year, when European Union leaders pressed Xi Jinping about China's human rights violations, including locking up over 1 million Uyghurs in concentration camps, who, by the way, Apple uses as slave labor to make their iPhones. I bet they don't tell you that. His first response was that Black Lives Matter shows that the United States is no better. Last month, when China's top diplomat came right here to the Alaska summit, in his opening remarks, he falsely asserts that the United States is slaughtering, that is his word, slaughtering black Americans, and that he hopes the United States does better on human rights. That would be laughable if it didn't have such serious consequences. They know that our greatest geopolitical advantage is not our nuclear arsenal. It is our moral standing. But now they're using American capitalism as a weapon to accomplish their own goals by using woke corporations to undermine the United States from within. Take Disney, just a couple of years ago, said it couldn't film in Georgia, in the state of Georgia, if they passed a new anti-abortion statute. Yet they just filmed Mulan last year in the Xinjiang province of China, which is literally ground zero, the epicenter of the Uyghur human rights crisis. And they didn't just film there, they went further. They said, we thank the local government. They thanked the CCP for allowing them to film there. That's Disney. The NBA, it's even worse. The NBA regularly, regularly decries alleged racial injustice here in the United States, yet it does not say a peep as they continue to expand into the Chinese market. It gets worse than that. When Daryl Morey, the general manager of the Houston Rockets once tweeted, fight for freedom, stand with Hong Kong. LeBron James, one of the most outspoken critics of the last president, one of the most outspoken supporters of Black Lives Matter, just last week tweeting a picture of a cop in Columbus, Ohio, and saying, hold him accountable. He's the guy who immediately came, of course, to China's public defense. This two-faced behavior of corporations and their celebrity cronies is not just an accident. It is by design. The CCP is playing us like a Chinese mandolin, and it's working, and they're doing it by using our own companies against us. And why are these companies doing it? The answer is plain and simple. Money. China restricts market access to any company who criticizes the CCP. And even better than that, it favors market access to China for companies who criticize the United States. It is as simple as that. Companies are simply doing what companies do, whatever allows them to make the most money. Unfortunately, the American people are falling for it. It's worked like a charm, especially for China. So it is now no surprise that they are using that same tactic to deflect accountability for COVID-19 as well, in particular, the origin of this virus. Let's just talk about the name of the virus. The Marburg virus is named after a town in Germany where that virus originated. The Ebola virus is named after a river in Africa where it came from. The Zika virus is named after a forest in Africa where it came from. Countless other examples. Japanese encephalitis virus. I could go on. Even when it comes to COVID-19, you can say the UK strain. You can say the South African strain. You can say the Brazilian strain. You can say the Indian double mutant strain. Any of those are perfectly acceptable. But if you say the Wuhan virus... You are immediately bashed as a racist and a bigot. Ask yourself why. The CCP has successfully weaponized not just the COVID-19 pandemic, but the woke pandemic 
by using the threat of racism against the United States to evade accountability for its own actions. And worst of all, American corporations are helping them at every step of the way. That is the real Chinese virus that we need to fight. It is a cultural virus that erodes America's greatest competitive advantage by equating American idealism with Chinese nihilism. And when that happens, nihilism wins every time. Thank you, LeBron James. Corporations win. Woke activists win. The Chinese Communist Party wins. The real losers of this game are the American people and American democracy itself. So what's the solution to all of this? In 1980, one of my heroes, Ronald Reagan, correctly identified that the greatest threat to individual liberty and prosperity in this country was big government. But today, that's only half the story. The real threat in America isn't just big government. It is this new hybrid of big government and big business. Look, I am all for cutting taxes and slashing government regulations. But as Abraham Lincoln, a great Republican, said 160 years ago, the dogmas of a quiet past are inadequate to the stormy present. We are going to need new legislative solutions, ones that meet the challenges of 2021, not just the challenges of 1980. This is no longer about just saving capitalism from big government. This is about saving capitalism from itself. In the short run, we're going to need legislative solutions that stay true to our unabiding belief in the power of private enterprise, yes, but while also recognizing the ways in which our system of private enterprise has been co-opted and corrupted by external forces. Take the case of big tech censorship. Conventional wisdom holds that technology companies should be free to regulate what content does and does not show up on their websites because of private companies and the First Amendment conventionally, only protects against big government censorship. Fine. But that actually misses the essence of what's happening in the real world today. The liberal wing of Congress has actually co-opted Silicon Valley through the back door to do what government cannot directly accomplish under the Constitution. If you have any doubt about that, look at what they do in these congressional hearings. Democrats regularly threaten social media companies with regulatory reprisal if they fail to take down so-called hate speech or misinformation. And it works. Last year, the day before yet another Democratic congressional grilling, Facebook announces new restrictions on so-called hate speech. And these restrictions became even more stringent after, of course, Democrats took control of the White House and the Senate, in addition to the House of Representatives. It was actually what Connecticut Senator Richard Blumenthal attributed to, in his words, quote unquote, a shift in the political winds. Those are his words. And he was right. Now, if those congressional threats are the stick, there's also the legislative carrot. That's Section 230 of the 1996 Communications Decency Act, which immunizes tech companies from liability for censoring otherwise constitutionally protected speech. So take it together. These actually represent a modern form of crony capitalism, except in reverse. Big government is actually able to turn companies into pawns to engage in otherwise constitutionally prohibited censorship. And personally, I believe that state action under the mantle of private enterprise is still state action. I believe we have to, a statutory fix for Section 230. We need to fix Section 230. And it says that if you benefit from this kind of broad federal immunity, then these tech companies also have to be bound by the same standards as federal government. Plain and simple. Federal government cannot dispatch a private company to do what the federal government can't do directly. And when that comes to political censorship, it means abiding by the standards of the First Amendment after all, even if you are a tech company, so long as you benefit from Section 230 immunity. I'm in favor of other legislative fixes that eliminate crony capitalism, and especially this reverse form of crony capitalism and the fundamental unfairness that results from it, especially fundamental unfairness arising from flawed policies in the first place. Let me give you another example. If we live in a world today where private businesses cannot discriminate on the basis of race, sex, or religious belief, then I do not believe those businesses should be able to discriminate on the basis of political belief either. Yet that is exactly what's happening day in and day out in our country today. We could easily solve that problem in a really simple way. Add political belief to the list of protected classes in Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, full stop. Now, of course, there's the libertarian side of my brain, even the libertarian side of my conscience, which says that, look, isn't it wrong to add just another rule to what private businesses can and can't do? Because in a libertarian utopia, the market should solve these problems on its own. 
I'll tell you how the market could solve the problem. For example, I used to think this way myself. If some businesses discriminated against conservatives, then that should, in theory, create a business opportunity for somebody else to capitalize on. For example, by hiring those same conservatives who are fired by these businesses over here. Well, guess what? That creates a market opportunity for the next guy who can just hire those fired conservatives. Sounds, sounds great on its face if you're in libertarian utopia. Here's the main problem with that argument. That same logic should apply to discrimination based on race, sex, or religion too. Yet as a society, we now unquestioningly accept those restraints on businesses. Now, perhaps there's an academic deb debate to be had somewhere about whether even those restrictions were or are a bad idea too. But that is truly a moot point today, since nobody, not a Republican, not a Democrat, not even any public libertarians are seriously advocating for the idea that businesses should be able to discriminate based on race or sex or religion. So my view is this, against that backdrop, if a business can't fire someone because they're black or Muslim or gay, then a business should not be able to fire someone just because they're an outspoken conservative either. If a social media can't kick you off their platform for being black or Muslim or gay, then they should not be able to deny you service just because you're a hardline Republican or a Democrat for that matter either. This is not just an academic debate. It is happening almost every day in this country. If it can happen to the 45th president of the United States, it can happen to anybody. I go through a handful of additional legal solutions in my upcoming book. But in reality, these legal solutions are just a form of symptomatic therapy. What we really need in this country is a cultural cure. The real solution to these problems is actually to gradually rebuild a shared vision of American identity that is so deep and so powerful that it dilutes this wokest nonsense to irrelevance. The answer does not actually begin with the government. It begins with everyday citizens who are willing to speak up and challenge the new woke dogma at school, at work, at home, and in their community. It also means cultivating a shared identity, both in ourselves and in the next generation of Americans with the revival of civic education that we have long missed in this country. Our schools teach our kids to view our history with shame rather than pride. Patriotism is on the decline. Religion has nearly disappeared. What does it even mean to be an American today in the year 2021? I cannot remember a time in my life where we more badly needed an answer to that question. And I personally believe that answering that question is the hardest and most important work we will ever do as Americans. Today, as a people, we are hungry for a cause. We are hungry for a sense of purpose. We are hungry for identity. The absence of a shared cause in America is the black hole at the center of our nation's soul. And when you have a vacuum that runs that deep, bad things start to fill the void. That is part of what makes wokeness so appealing as the new religion of our time. It is the modern version of opioid for our masses. As Americans, our jobs in the coming years is to fill that void with something more meaningful than just wokeness. Americans are hungry for a cause, and yet we have forgotten that in America, our country itself can be that cause. We have spent over a decade celebrating our diversity and our differences that we have forgotten all of the ways in which we're actually the same, united by a common set of ideals as a country. Most nations throughout human history were defined on the basis of an ethnicity or a language or religion, or a monarch, not America. We were the first and greatest country defined on the basis of a set of ideals that unified a polyglot divided group of people. America was not just a place, it was a shared vision of what that place could be. And a fundamental part of that vision was the American dream. The idea that no matter who your parents were, you can achieve your dreams with hard work, your own commitment, and your own ingenuity. I have lived that dream. We call it the American dream for a reason. It is not a destination that we reach. It is a vision that we aspire to, one that we will always fall short of, but continue to keep pursuing. Anyway, that is part of what it means to have a dream. But over the last decade, something scary happened. We woke up. And once you wake up from a dream, you forget what it was all about. You might remember how it felt, and pretty soon you forget that too. That's the real danger of wokeness. But we still have time to get it right. 
if the 2010s were about celebrating our demographic diversity, then the 2020s should be about celebrating what binds us together as a people, the American dream, e pluribus unum, from many, one. The other side might say this is just a load of high-minded drivel because we never lived up to our ideals as a country. And you know what? They have a point. It's true that America isn't perfect. We weren't perfect at our founding. We aren't perfect today. I will venture to say we never will be perfect as a country. But more than any nation in human history, America is the pursuit of perfection, the pursuit of a more perfect union, the pursuit of happiness, the pursuit of liberty, equality, and justice for all. These are the values that won the American Revolution. These are the values that reunited us after the Civil War. These are the values that won us World War I and World War II and the Cold War. These are the values that still give hope to the free world. And if we embrace these common values, then nobody in the world, not a corporation, not a nation, not a virus is going to defeat us. That is what true American exceptionalism is all about. And that is what we will need to marshal in order to defeat this new cultural epidemic. Thank you.